Okay guys, so here we are in PowerPoint number three, our final PowerPoint about death investigation. Okay, so we've talked about um, several processes, the three mortises, uh, vitreous humor, stomach contents, um, tacé noir. Okay, and all of those, you know, they help us get a time frame. a lot of times between 12 and 24 hours, okay? But what happens after basically the 36 hour mark, okay? So why does rigor mortis go away, okay? Why are those muscles returning to being movable and pliable again? What that means is that the process of decomposition has begun. And this is one of the, fits into the category of, yep, very natural, um, obeys the laws of biology, but a lot of the pictures you're gonna see in this PowerPoint especially, are a little hard to look at, okay? So once again, just keep in mind, this is nature. So decomposition is also known as putrefaction. If you've ever heard the word putrid, which basically means rotten, okay? That's where that comes from. So this process is driven by all of the bacteria that is in our intestines, which remember when we're alive, it's great, okay? It helps keep us healthy, helps our immune system, helps us digest our food and produces vitamins for us. But once a person dies, then okay, all bets are off. And now the bacteria can basically go on kind of a, a feeding frenzy and they are gonna start to spread beyond the walls of your intestine, okay? And you also have a lot of bacteria in your upper airway simply because you have to breathe, right? And there's a lot of nasty stuff that's floating around in the air. So we can tell that a person is starting to enter decomposition, which is basically post 36 hours, uh, because first of all, the abdomen is gonna start to bloat with gases produced by the bacteria that are now multiplying very, very rapidly, okay? So decomposition or putrefaction is going to, well, the bacteria are gonna start to produce a gas called hydrogen sulfide, which is H2S. And I know as Iowa people, you have smelled it. So anytime you're driving down the highway and you get punched in the face by, you know, what smells like cow manure um, or some type of farm smell, that's hydrogen sulfide. It's that rotten egg smell. So you can smell it manure. You can smell it basically anything that is dead and rotting, like a raccoon by the side of the road, or also like if a, you know, the, the freezer goes out and a bunch of meat starts to rot, okay? That will produce it too, because there's bacteria there. And so this is the gas that they are going to produce. This gas also causes the tissues that it's in to change color. So especially in the abdomen, the body is going to bloat, it's going to get bigger, and then it's going to start to turn kind of a brownish green. Another thing that can happen is skin slippage, okay? So once the, the decomposition process really gets going, then the bacteria can make their way in between the layers of skin. And so the, the you know, an entire skin of someone's hand can come off, which we call degloving. okay? It can happen on other appendages. And you'll see things that look like big blisters, okay? Like the person has been scalded or burnt, but it actually is just, it's coming from within and it's just the process of decomposition. Okay, one thing that happens too, that it would be really cool, uh, except it's in a decomposing body, but, is something called marbling, okay? So marbling is when the hydrogen sulfide from bacteria starts to spread. And once it gets into the bloodstream, it can react with hemoglobin, which is the primary component of red blood cells. And when those two things react, they produce a dark color or a dark pigment. And so you can end up seeing the outline of blood vessels in a body. Okay, so I'm going to have you go to the first picture here. Now, first of all, this is a deceased female. Okay, and obviously, you know, it looks like she had some level of obesity. But what you see here, that's not fat. That's what I mean by the abdomen swelling with gases. Okay, so that's an example of, you know, decomposition putrefaction. Um, and then you can see 
the marbling because you can see the outline of the blood vessels, which it's kind of neat. You know, I mean, we, those blood vessels are always there, but normally because our blood is flowing, we don't see them, but there's a lot of intricate branches and arterial trees that you never see when you're alive. And, but they become visible when, after death, if the person is going into decomposition. Okay. And that's what marbling is. So as, like I mentioned, the, the gases produced by the bacteria, which is primarily hydrogen sulfide, yeah, they're going to start spreading. They're going to, eventually they're going to make it past the abdomen and they're going to start moving through blood vessels. Um, so one thing to know is that decomposition always starts in the intestines because that's where the most bacteria is. And once a person dies, that bacteria is gonna start multiplying exponentially, okay? So the body is gonna bloat, which means that it's gonna, you know, basically get big and swollen because of the gases. You may also see what is called purge fluid. So, you know, it's, it's kind of basic physics when you have all this gas being produced, anything that is in an orifice of the body, whether it's in the nose or um, the airways or in the rectum, the, the pressure of that gas is going to push that fluid out of that orifice. And that's what we call purge fluid. Okay. Also, if that person happens to be in an environment um, where they are accessible to insects, specifically um, houseflies is the most common species. But if they are, you know, accessible to them, and really we all are, no matter how airtight we'd like to have our houses, you know, you always are going to see like a lone ant or a lone fly, but especially if the person is outside. Normally within a few hours after death, flies are going to visit that body and they're going to lay eggs. And then it takes time for those eggs to hatch into larvae or what we commonly know as maggots. And so that's when you're going to start seeing maggot masses and insect activity on the body. Okay, so the next picture that you're going to see in the PowerPoint is a young male. Um, and he is in decomposition, even though, I mean, he doesn't look in bad shape. But the reason we can tell that is because... The, the gases from the bacteria, the, the decomposition gases, have basically pushed his tongue out of his mouth, okay? So that's simply from gas buildup. And, you know, if he had had any fluid in his nose or airway, that would be coming out as well. But that's just, you know, gas production, and it's kind of like blowing up a balloon. You know, eventually the balloon's going to pop, or that gas is going to expand the balloon, and the same thing is happening here, but they are, it's gas produced by bacteria within the body. Okay, next photo um, shows the presence of maggot masses. So um, flies are going to be attracted to moist areas of the body. So the nostrils, the eyes, the mouth, um, if the person is naked, the, the genital and rectal regions. And then also if there's a wound, any type of bloody, whether it's a knife wound or a gunshot wound, yeah, the flies are going to be attracted to that area. The reason is they want to lay their eggs on a surface that has some type of liquid content because it gives their eggs the best chance of hatching, okay, because they can dry out really fast. So this would be after about... 24 hours where you can see definitely the masses and then in a very short time these are hatching and so these will become maggots and they will start eating away the tissue um, wherever they are forming. Once again, okay, not pleasant to look at. Okay, so decomposition always follows this order. It's going to start always in the intestines because that's where most of the bacteria is. Okay, like I mentioned, we all have to inhale and exhale to stay alive. So you also have actually a lot of bacteria that's in your upper airway, like back where your tonsils are, okay, at the back of your throat. So it can also start there as well, but much more bacteria in your intestines. Okay, so from the intestines, it's then going to spread to the abdominal organs, then through your blood vessels. Finally, it's going to start heading through your voluntary muscles of your extremities, your arms, and your legs. 
And then finally, it's gonna spread to what we call capsulated organs, which just means that like the bladder, kidneys, and brain, they all have pretty tough membranes on the outside of them. And so it takes longer for the bacteria to kind of eat through it, okay? So those organs will be second to last. And then the absolute last um, organ to decompose is if you have a biological female who has not had a hysterectomy, meaning that her uterus is still intact, um, even if she's very, very decomposed, th that uterus can still be there because it is made up of really, really, really strong muscle, right? Which it should be because it pushes a baby out. So it's a really, really strong, tough organ. And even if a body is fully decomposed, sometimes the pathologist, if they locate a uterus, and it might be the only thing left, they can say, okay, this was a biological female. Okay, so the rate of decomposition is very dependent on two main factors, okay? One is temperature, meaning the ambient temperature, and the second is blood volume, okay? So I've removed the pictures here, but you can look in your PowerPoint. Okay, so what we have in this picture are two victims of a homicide, and it was actually a mom and a dad, and they were killed within a few minutes of each other by their mentally ill son, okay? But dad's body was discovered in an upper floor bedroom where the house did not have air conditioning, and it was in the middle of summer, so very, very hot, and you can see he is very, very decomposed, okay? He looks bloated. Um, there's a lot of marbling. Um, he's starting to be very, very discolored and, you know, basically not physically rec or visually recognizable. That's what decomposition looks like. You can also see marbling present on him, okay? Mom, who was killed just a few minutes later, was kept in the basement, which was much, much cooler, okay? So one thing bacteria love, well, actually two things. They love heat up to a certain point, okay? And they love lots of moisture. Wherever you have lots of, where it's a warm temperature and there's moisture available, the bacteria are gonna, you know, multiply exponentially. So in mom's body, the bacterial action was greatly slowed down simply because it was much colder in the basement. Okay, but they look completely different in terms of decomposition, but were killed at basically the same time, and it all has to do with the temperature, the ambient temperature of where the bodies were. Okay, the next case shows an example of blood volume. Okay, so here you have two people, a male and a female, who um, I believe this was a result of a drug deal gone bad. Someone came up behind them and basically executed them, okay? So the male was shot in the head, so did not bleed out a lot, okay? So he had most of his blood volume left intact. I mean, obviously a head wound's gonna bleed, but the majority, they, they didn't hit a major artery, okay? So you can see, very bloated, starting to turn that very dark, you know, greenish brown, almost blackish color, okay? Full-blown decomp. And also, you know, very bloated, not visually recognizable. The female next to him took a bullet in the neck and it directly hit her carotid artery and she lost most of her blood volume, okay? So bacteria love moving through the blood because blood is mostly water. And if she lost her blood volume, the bacteria are going to multiply much less rapidly, okay? So the difference, these two killed at roughly the same time. The difference was one had a lot of blood, the other had lost a great percentage of her blood volume, okay? So keep in mind, high you know, temperature and blood volume can greatly affect the rate of decomposition. Okay, this next photo, if you're looking at the PowerPoint, this is slide nine. This kind of shows you an up-close um, example of what full-blown decomposition looks like. First of all, it doesn't matter what our race is. Every person, if they decompose, are gonna turn this greenish brown and eventually be really like jet black 
in color. You can see marbling. You can also see what we talked about, skin slippage right here. Kind of looks like the person is holding on to a baseball or something, but that is the hydrogen sulfide produced by the bacteria that's gotten in between those layers of skin and caused it to puff out. And yeah, eventually the gas pressure is going to get so great that that skin is going to split and it's gonna leak fluid and it's gonna look like, you know, the person's been scalded and looks like a big wound, but it's just being driven by the natural um, decomposition, you know, which is driven by bacteria, basically. Okay, next photo, slide 10. This is um, something that pathologists call Swiss cheese brain, okay? Normally your brain does not have holes in it. And I mean, the holes in Swiss cheese, I'm sorry if I'm ruining Swiss cheese for any of you, but um, the holes in Swiss cheese are caused by the bacteria that's fermenting the cheese producing gas. And that's why it has holes in it. Same thing here, okay? So this is a person who's been decomposing for a long time, because remember, the brain is one of the last few organs to decompose simply because it's encapsulated. It has tough membranes called the meninges that are on the outside of it. And so, yeah, it's more resistant to decomposition, okay? So this would be later, later in the game, depending on what the ambient temperature was. Okay, these next two pictures, slides 11 and 12, I just wanna show you how that once decomposition starts, it, it's accelerated, okay? And if you put someone in a, the cooler at the, the morgue, it, yeah, it can slow down decomposition because the bacteria are growing at a lesser rate because of the temperature, but it's not gonna stop it, okay? If you don't wanna decompose, the only thing that you can do is be cremated basically. Even bodies that are embalmed are going to decompose. They're going to do a lot, a lot more slowly depending on the skill of the embalmer and what condition the person was in when they died. But yeah, it's still going to happen. It's just going to, ha you know, it's going to be slowed down. But here's an example of a person. This is a female and she died as a result of drowning. Okay, so you can see that she has a lot of debris and she's pretty decomposed when she's pulled out of the water. Um, you can see marbling on her chest. You can see that she's very bloated. You can also see marbling on her arm. Um, and I believe the, the water temperature was pretty warm, so it makes sense. Bacteria love moisture and they love warm temperatures. So yeah, kind of advanced decomposition. But this is her when she's removed from the water. And then this next picture was about 12 hours later after she had been in the cooler at the morgue and then they're ready to do the autopsy, okay? So much more advanced decomposition. So, and this is the same person, there and then there. So while going into the cooler can slow down this process a little bit, you know, once it's started, it's going to move pretty quickly. Um, if she had been left out at the temperature that was outside, it would have been, you know, even much more worse than this. So, you know, just realize that, yeah, people decompose kind of no matter what the temperature is. So here's an example of why, you know, especially people who might be interested in being in law enforcement or future death investigators, keep in mind this you know, the way a person looks when they're in full decomposition, they may look nothing like a driver's license picture, a photograph, you know, and my God, if you have any compassion, you're not going to show this person to a loved one and say, oh, is this your dad? Is this your sister? No, because they're going to look completely different, you know, so there's the whole, they're not going to be able to identify them anyway. And you wouldn't want to leave a loved one with that image, you know, as the last thing they remember. Okay. So here's an example of a deceased person that was actually a pretty skinny white man. And then as he decomposes, he looks like a much larger person and you can't tell anything about that person's race, okay? Even if they were African-American or dark, dark skin, because everyone turns basically jet black and their features become very bloated and distorted um, when they are decomposing, okay? So yeah, you, would you wouldn't be able to do a visual identification on this. You'd have to use another method, like hopefully fingerprints maybe, or um, DNA or dental records. Okay, so bodies in water. So when someone drowns or when a body is thrown into the water, 
it's gonna sink according to gravity because it's heavy. So once decomposition happens and those gases are produced, the gases will often bring the body to the surface unless it's trapped on some debris. And even then, bodies as they decompose can start to disarticulate, meaning that they come apart at the joints. And so you might find just, you know, an arm or a foot. But a pathologist would be able to tell that, oh yeah, this was due to decomposition. This wasn't that someone took some type of sharp, you know, tool and, you know, dismembered this body. So typical time frames. if you're looking at, say, the Coralville Reservoir in the middle of July, yeah, they're going to rise due to decomposition in about eight to 10 days. Colder water, meaning that in the spring or in the fall, about two to three weeks. Remember, because bacteria love water and moisture, skin slippage is going to be extensive. And especially if it's hot water, like if it's down in the Florida Everglades, oh, decomp is going to go really, really fast because warm water, you know, bacteria love it. Um, and it's going to go much faster, okay, the warmer the water is. Okay, so... In picture slide number 15 in PowerPoint 3, this is actually the photo that my students tend to tell me is the worst for them. So this is what skin slippage looks like. And, you know, just like the skin of the hand, you can have a person that gets degloved. You can also, and I don't know what the term is, I think we just call it skin slippage, but basically de-socked, okay? So this is just the layers of skin coming off because they're separated by the gases from the bacteria. Now, sometimes this can be useful, and I have seen this done in our lab, and it sounds horrific, okay? And I, I don't know why this guy's smiling. I guess that's the reflex when you have your picture taken. But if you have a person that is so decomposed that you cannot have any other way to identify them, one of the ways you hope for are fingerprints, okay? Now, fingerprints not everyone is in the fingerprint database, okay? So it's not always helpful, but if you can get them and search them, it's better than nothing. So if that person's skin, if they have extensive skin slippage, you can put a glove on your hand and then put the person's hand over yours and then physically roll them for fingerprints and they produce really good quality fingerprints. And then fingers crossed, you hope that either they were arrested before or they work a job in law enforcement where they have to give their fingerprints or they were in the military. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people out there that haven't ever had their fingerprints taken. And so that can be an issue, but you know, this is, and yes, it's horrific when you think about it, but when you're in the zone where you're just trying to help identify a person so you can find their loved ones, um, and find out what happened to them, then you do things like this. Okay. And I mean, scientifically it's a, it's a good technique. Okay, the next topic, and this has to do with bodies in cold water, is the forming of something called adipocere. And it's commonly called, kind of the you know, slang term for it is um, grave wax. So what adipocere is, it's formed down from the breakdown of fatty acids, which is a very common component of the human body, um, but specifically in cold water. Okay, so when you're looking at the person in slide 17 of the PowerPoint, you know, I would, I mean, that person looks to be a biological female, but that's all I'm going to be able to tell you because they are very, very decomposed. I'm not going to try to guess about, you know, race or anything else. But one of the things about adipocere is it's kind of, it's, it's the worst smelling thing on the earth, in my opinion, but it's very greasy. It's almost like, you know, when you, you have a candle burning and then you blow the candle out and the wax isn't, you know, liquid, but it's starting to get solid, but you can still move it around. That is the consistency of adipocere. And because of that, it's actually very protective of the internal organs, okay? So while this person looks like they're in really rough shape on the outside, there's a good chance that that pathologist is gonna be able to go in there and find at least some organs intact um, to do the autopsy, okay? So it can be very protective. I guess that's the one, you know, advantage of it, but yeah, you know, hard to look at. 
but specifically break down of fatty acids and most of the time in cold water. Okay, mummification is something that occurs in low humidity environments, meaning that the environment is hot and very dry. So there, it's more common to see bodies that are mummified in states like Arizona or New Mexico or you know Southern California, uh, Nevada, um, anywhere where the humidity is very low. It's not that common here um, in Iowa, especially when it occurs outside. But it can progress up to a year. Now the person is still gonna decompose. They're gonna lose all of their fluids. It's gonna be stinky. They're gonna have insect activity, but eventually the skin is gonna dry out and it's basically gonna be preserved and kind of, you know, be very much kind of like leather. So you wouldn't be able to determine the race of the person. Um, you know, you may be able to preserve some tattoos or other markings and, um, you won't have blood anymore, but some of the internal organs will be intact. So, um, you know, it can, it can preserve a body indefinitely. It's not going to be reduced to skeletal remains or just bones like it would in Florida um, or even in Iowa in the summer. Okay, so go through here. Okay. So our last topic that I want to show you is when bodies are burned in a fire. So whenever this happens, bodies will show a certain positioning or posture called pugilistic attitude. So attitude is just, you know, the, the fancy medical word for posture. Pugilistic comes from the term pugilist, which was the old fashioned term for a boxer. So when you think of a boxer standing there and they're holding out their boxing gloves in front of them because they're ready to start the fight, that's where pugilistic attitude or posturing was taken from. So this posture is produced by muscle contraction caused by intense heat. So, you know, a car crash where every, uh, the vehicles catch on fire and they're going to burn very, very hot. Um, any bodies that are fully engulfed in a fire. And you can't, like, it will break rigor, okay? So the bodies are not in rigor, okay? They're in that position because of muscle contraction due to heat. And when bodies are burned in a fire, and this is another example of why we need pathologists and why we need well-trained death investigators, because you may see other artifacts like skull fractures, even though the skull fracture is due to heat, um, alone. Okay. But an inexperienced death investigator may look at those remains and say, oh, this person was murdered. They were killed by blunt force trauma. Someone beat them in the head and that's why they died. When in fact, all of those fractures are due to just the, the fire. Okay. One other way that we can tell if the person was alive and breathing when a fire was active is the person will have soot in their trachea, okay? Now, this doesn't mean that the person um, was conscious, okay? Most people who die in fires, they're not, they're not screaming and, you know, killed by the heat of the fire. It's not painful. Most of the time, because carbon monoxide is produced in a fire, that person, especially if they were asleep to begin with, they are completely unconscious and basically deceased except for respiratory um, reflexes by the time the fire actually reaches the body. Okay? However, if you find soot in the trachea, that means that there were some type of breathing reflex happening. And so technically that person was alive. So people that think, oh yeah, I'm just going to kill someone and then I'm going to put the body in a house and burn it down and people will think that they died in a fire. Well, it could happen in a coroner state, absolutely. But in Iowa, no, because in a forensic autopsy, remember, they are going to dissect the throat and it's pretty easy to detect soot in the trachea. And I'll show you an example of it. So let me leave this on here. And then if you want to look at the last couple of photos we have. Okay, so this is a body photographed from above. And that's what pugilistic attitude looks like. You can see that the arms are bent and it's kind of like how a boxer would have his boxing gloves when he's going to start a fight. Okay, also the uh, muscles of the leg 
contract and so the legs are drawn up and you know kind of spread a little almost like um, the baby pose if you've ever done yoga but that's very common pugilistic attitude and it's simply due to muscle contraction due to heat okay here is what I'm talking about in an autopsy um, when they dissect the the neck so they're going to look in the airway so what you're seeing on the right hand of the photo is the person's tongue okay it looks like it was singed in the fire but remember that person was likely unconscious they did not feel anything but they were breathing because you can see that black soot is all the way down their trachea and it's starting to go into the bronchioles of the lung so yep that person had respiratory reflexes when that fire um, was occurring and then finally um, this is what post-mortem skull fractures look like so this is a person's skull you know obviously burnt beyond recognition in a fire and yeah sometimes that is what happens with heat so this is why you want a qualified death investigator that can say, yep, you know, that's postmortem. And also a pathologist and also an anthropologist would be able to look at the margins of those bones and say, absolutely, this was due to heat and it was it occurred postmortem. Whereas someone who's not well trained could say, oh, that person was beaten to death and they were murdered. You know, this is definitely a homicide when it could have been you know, an accident. The person fell asleep smoking in bed or they were sleeping and a candle was left burning and it burned the house down. So that's why it's so important to have really qualified people that can determine, you know, these types of injuries where they occurred before death or after death. Okay, so that's our last PowerPoint. No more gross photos for you. Well, at least in this unit. Um, so yeah, that's it. We're done with PowerPoint number three. All right, thank you.